also thank you for joining thank you for the invitation to give a talk at uh, chapman university it's a great uh, opportunity as well uh, so in today's talk uh, i i'm going to discuss detecting single gravitons with quantum sensing and i would start with acknowledging and thanking my co-authors here germain tober he is a phd student at stockholm university and thomas also a phd student at uh, stevens institute of technology and igor as uh, igor pikowski and uh, i would also like to thank uh, different uh, funding agencies who also supported this work and of course the idea here is to detect uh, in basically potentially infer existence of, or exchange of uh, a single gravitons with matter uh, in a potentially tabletop kind of uh, experiment and i want to basically uh, start with this idea that uh, should be helpful to have this early 1900s mindset of uh, quantum optics when we uh, go further so if you try to recall what happened in the early 1900s you know electro electromagnetism or maxwell's equations were was a quite successful theory of the 19th century so and then the main issue that concerned people at the time was how do you reconcile certain uh, observation primarily in the thermodynamic uh, uh, sense and see if they are consistent with consistent with maxwell's equations and one of them or the most one of the most important one is the of the deviation from uh, predicted black body radiation spectrum as opposed as opposed to what one see sees in the experiment so to briefly summarize what what happens here happened here is that if you look at the the rate at which uh, black bodies ed, uh, emit radiation and how how do how 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 does it depend on frequencies people observe that in the large wavelength regime which is basically the low energy uh, regime things kind of agreed well with the predictions of the classical uh, predictions where you can take for example a key partition of energy and so on to study the statistical properties of uh, light however what when people try to look at the uh, small wavelength regime or this is the high frequency regime there were significant departures from what a classical theory predicted a classical theory predicted that uh, the radiation would uh, the rate of radiation would in fact go to infinity towards this uh, ultraviolet regime so this is what's called ultraviolet catastrophe and people were trying to address uh, how to reconcile that and there were also attempts theoretical models which for example worked well in the uh, high frequency regime but did not work so well in the low frequency regime so max planck had this uh, quite uh, exciting idea that uh, you could think about uh, a black body as a cavity whose walls are charged particles oscillating and then they emit radiation uh, but only proportional to the frequency of each of these uh, oscillators charged oscillators and he suggested that thinking this way basically that uh, this radiation emitted are uh, in its bar uh, sorry uh, in unit proportional to the frequency and this proportionality constant is actually the planck's constant he could actually find a very good theory that fit the experimental observations and that explained the planks uh, uh, so that that became the uh, black body radiation spectrum that planck uh, was able to correct and uh, match the experiments and concurrently in fact einstein was also very much puzzled by this uh, high frequency behavior of light and uh, he was also independently thinking for example the from the experimental data of uh, black body radiation spectrum he was trying to he could compute for example the entropy and this this was also suggesting discrete nature of light but of course the most uh, discussed uh, effect that einstein proposed is the photoelectric uh, effect that uh, and here there are two key observations one is that uh, there was this observation that uh, um, electrons are emitted from metal metallic surfaces for example when light is incident on metallic surfaces but then there were uh, one of the propose one of the suggestion was that uh, einstein einstein proposed that the intensity of the light is not the key factor in this process it is the frequency of light so there is a certain threshold frequency below which you don't see any emission at all and then even if you increase intensity of light this does not uh, cause any emission of electrons you have to meet the threshold frequency 
And the other key effect is that the maximum kinetic energy of uh, the ele ejector electron, which you would measure by some voltage measurements that you would try to stop the electron from reaching one of the cathodes. So that that would be uh, that would also be proportional to frequency, not intensity. So it's not the fact that uh, uh, increasing, adding up classical energy little by little, you can uh, excite electrons. Rather, you have to have this uh, meet this, these two strong requirements. And the second fact, for example, these two combined basically tells you that it is a single photon that does the job. So this is a single photon or the frequency response that matters best. And uh, there were two, I mean, uh, there were also experimental confirmations of this. There was an earlier experiment by Philip Leonard and also Millikan who wanted to, he was actually trying to disprove Einstein that this need cannot be the case. If I do a careful experiment, I should be able to, or Millikan was thinking that he should be able to show that uh, Einstein was wrong, but he ended up uh, actually show, agreeing to Einstein in this regard. And then if we fast forward to today's quantum optics, it is, uh, it things look a little bit more of, for obvious reasons developed and there are new ideas if someone asks uh, what is quantum optics today or what is a photon. And uh, one, one of the interesting input is that a semi-classical limit of QED would also work to catch, capture the essential features of the photoelectric effect. And uh, this semi-classical limit, however, uh, it also has uh, certain issues. It is it is a convenient approximation in the sense that it violates energy conservation, for example. So a full description also requires to account for this uh, quantized energy exchanges with the matter. The uh, I would say one, one of the other crucial elements that we know about photoelectric effect and inferring a uh, quantized exchange of energy with light in this context is the time delay argument. This basically tells that, for example, I can compute the energy that is added, built upon the metal uh, by a continuous classical flux of uh, uh, energy by a, a continuous wave. And in order to say that indeed the energy exchanges are quantized, one should be able to see quantum gems on the matter side, which are uh, which happen at a time scale shorter than the time scale it would take for a classical uh, wave to build up the same amount of energy. So this is the time delay argument. And it has been shown that one can in fact measure within this time scale. And it also follows from the analysis as well that quantum mechanically, there is certain probability to measure in an excited state when you have an interaction. Of course, there is more in quantum optics and in general quantum information now, Bell inequality violations. This is the only loophole free test of non-classicality. There is also sub-Poisonian statistics and hongo mandel effects also. It also comes from Rochester and uh, Wigner negativity squeezing non-classical correlations and so on. So the, the QED or quantum electrodynamics or quantum optics has developed quite a bit in the last uh, century beyond what originally uh, conceptual, conceptualized by Planck and Einstein. But it is what is most important in terms of uh, the photoelectric effect or what happened in uh, the 1900s is that these people were working with the theories known to them at that point of time. So the resources that they could uh, use to kind of make this leap in uh, understanding of uh, basically suggesting that light consists of discrete uh, packets of energy and then matter and light exchanged energy in this discrete way, given the resources or Mat things that were known to physicists at the time, it was a major breakthrough in terms of our understanding of quantum nature of light. So this talk is also in a way inspired by the same kind of thought process. The question is whether we can detect a graviton in this uh, early 1900s sense of detecting a photon. So I would, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the conventional answer to this question. And the conventional answer to this question is no. And for example, I mean, there are quite uh, some interesting work in the literature. For example, Dyson has looked into this question and he, among many other things, one of the things he did is that he looked at the strain sensitivity required by LIGO to detect a single graviton strain amplitude. So you know that uh, LIGO is a classical gravitational wave. So it, it comes with certain energy density and you can divide that by 
a single graviton uh, energy density to compute the number of gravitons in a single LIGO event, for example, the first gravitational detection. And you can estimate how many gravitons are contained in this uh, gravitational wave. And it turns out to be a large number, 10 raised to 36 number of gravitons are contained in a single gravita gravitational wave that we can detect in the LIGO band. However, to detect, so uh, Dyson's argument was that in order to detect this single graviton, you need to also improve your sensitivity by these many uh, orders of magnitude. And he also computes, for example, for simple mass configurations, what would be the absorption cross-section for absorbing a single graviton? And that turns out to be of the order of uh, Planck area. Uh, yeah, so his conclusion was that it is not possible to detect a graviton with this kind of uh, approaches. And another textbook example, I would say, is uh, the calculation by Weinberg in his book. So if you know how uh, light and mat matter interact in quantum optics is through this dipole transition. So what Weinberg did is a very similar calculation. So he looked at, instead of dipole, we know that uh, gravitational waves coupled to matter through quadrupole moment. So he looked at a transition quadrupole uh, moment and then the transition rate corresponding to this uh, process. and he so basically, you take the initial wave function as a ground state, and sorry, the final initial wave function as the excited state, and the final wave function as the ground state, and compute the quadrupole moment that induces a transition between them, and compute the rate at which this would happen. This would be spontaneous emission if you are in the first excited state and then going to the ground state, for instance. And he computes the rate of spontaneous emission from a hydrogen atom, so 3D2 level to 1S level of hydrogen atom, he computes this number 10 is to minus 44. So if you think about, uh, for example, comparing to age of the universe, that's about 10 raised to 14 billion years. So this is still several orders of magnitude. So you need to wait quite a long time to see, and it's impractical. And in fact, Born and Rothman later did a more careful analysis of the same problem. And they find that there's a four orders of magnitude improvement, but still, it is the Weinberg's conclusion is true. This it is there is almost no chance of seeing a graviton spontaneously emitted from a hydrogen atom in feasible any feasible time scales. So I I also wanted to briefly run through how such a calculation is done and what is the careful calculation that goes into this. So we are in this linearized uh, gravity regime. So the, you look at small perturbation, linear perturbations around a flat. Minkowski kind of space time. And uh, this is kind of quite standard that in this linearized uh, uh, low energy regime, you can think about uh, uh, quantized gravity in the same way as you think about electromagnetic waves quantized. And uh, a good way to think about gravitational waves is that you can go into the, this also, this comes from GR, that you could think, uh, think in the uh, transverse and traceless uh, gauge. This is a particular gauge choice that removes all the you know, GR has a lot of degrees of uh, freedom, uh, redundant degrees of freedom, mainly coming from I mean, 10, coming from the uh, gauge choice. You can do general coordinate transformation. So if you fix all these, uh, you end up with two remaining polarizations. These are the plus and cross polarization of gravitational waves. However, to see how matter responds to that, it is better to go into a local inertial frame or choose a different set of coordinates, the Fermi coordinates. And in this, you can basically write down an interaction Hamiltonian in, in the local inertial frame. And this basically gives you a quadrupole-like uh, interaction uh, with the gravitational wave. So here H is the gravitational amplitude, and we, we, we are kind of assuming sort of plane waves in this example. And uh, Born and Rothman, actually, their paper has a very good and careful uh, analysis of uh, different gauge fixing that's done and so on in this context. So to quantize, one would uh, uh, basically what you do in electromagnetism, you take the Fourier amplitudes and then promote them to operators. And one can compute in the same way, uh, what is the graviton transition rate? And that's how, and this look, this is the Fermi golden rule for this interaction, given this density of states for gravitons, you get this very small number 10 raised to minus 40 uh, per second. So now uh, our, we also ask the same question, can we detect a graviton? And our answer to this question is yes, we can detect a graviton. And before going into details of how we do this, I want to 
basically briefly respond to the arguments of Dyson and uh, Weinberg in this regard. So one of the thing that we learned from photoelectric effect is that we don't need a single photon to detect or infer the ex existence of a single photon. So you, you can basically have a torch at uh, which contain many photons, but provided that the frequencies are matching, you can still have a single uh, excitation events on the matter side, and that would corresponds to interactions at the level of a single photon, and then therefore you can infer single photon on the field side with energy conservation. So we don't need sensitivity at the level of, in principle, we don't need that kind of sensitivity that was predicted by Dyson. However, one more important point here is that maybe to infer energy exchanges, LIGO is not the best uh, choice of detector to uh, we should be looking at, uh, we should be measuring energy on the matter side or energy exchanges on the matter side, energy transitions. And to go back to Weinberg's comment, which is mainly that at a level of an atom, the spontaneous emission rate and also uh, stimulated rates are very small. So it is infeasible to detect in experiments. What we do to address, how do we address this comment is that we focus on massive quantum systems and stimulated processes instead of uh, spontaneous uh, processes. And combined with this uh, quantum sensing that I briefly mentioned, which can in principle allow us to infer single graviton exchange events. And for this, we use Weber bars with a quantum test. And I actually want to take a small detour to uh, Weber bars. You know, uh, I already mentioned that uh, there is this gauge, uh, this coordinate transformation degree of freedom, uh, coordinate transformation freedom in GR. So GR, the action is invariant under generic general coordinate transformations. And therefore there was a lot of discussions about uh, whether you can get rid of gravitational waves to maybe you can choose a correct gauge that, you know, you can fix gravitational waves and there's, there are no gravitational waves. Maybe this is an artifact. And this was, the, this was an ongoing discussion for a long time, in, including in the 50s. And uh, Joseph Weber was this person who came up with the, the idea that you can take a big road and this measure gravitational waves and see if there is actually a wave. And the idea was obviously to measure the position of the bar to great accuracy. And naturally, this required very uh, high precision measurements and very good sensitivity. In fact, a lot of early works in time continuous quantum sensing was motivated by the physics and requirements of, in general, gravitational wave detection, including uh, the physics of uh, Weber bars. And and in, and uh, naturally, they were trying. Weber was in, very much motivated to detect classical gravitational waves. In fact, he also made a claim, uh, a few claims of detection. One, the I would say the most famous one is the supernova event in 1987. And however, this one was, uh, it was discredited because there was not enough evidences. And of course, uh, LIGO was not available at the time to do uh, correlate with LIGO. And what happened is that this LIGO, which has this very different way of uh, detecting, not too different, but this, conceptually different idea of measuring position in an interferometer uh, setting that caught up and then it has become the mainstream I approach to detecting gravitational waves and uh, ended up actually discovering, discovering the existence of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, so Weber, Weber bars were simply, one, they were too weak to detect uh, gravitational waves in principle and uh, the second, aspect is that there were too many noise uh, issues, especially with these position measurements that uh, you cannot make conclusive uh, evidence of detection, claims of detection of a gravitational wave using Weber bars. And uh, how we overcome is, this issue is that we include this uh, quantum test in this uh, uh, detection process. So we, we basically include, uh, we look at the energy transitions of the bar with to some extent, it is really new in this uh, uh, field as well. And But uh, mainly our idea is to see if we can infer single energy exchanges at the level of single graviton with the Weber bar detector. And given that it is a weakly coupled system, we indeed find that there are regimes where we can maximize these single 
graviton exchange events. So how do we do, go about uh, uh, doing that? Also, please feel free to interrupt me in between if you have any questions. So uh, what we do here is that we take this uh, bar and we want to understand how this uh, bulk object coupled to gravitational waves. So we, we one can basically make this into smaller unit cells and uh, each of consisting of an array of atoms in one dimension, each of these atomic planes are oscillating with a D by frequency. And then each of the atoms has a small displacement around the mean position. And we can go to a continuum more uh, basically description where this, you can do a coordinate transformation to the collective modes of uh, oscillations of the bar in the in elastic or mechanics. This would be the acoustic modes of the bar. And when you compare the, and they, these acoustic modes are basically independent quantum harmonic oscillators. And when you compare the energy density of these collective modes with respect to the old uh, modes, you can come, you can find that uh, each of these uh, independent acoustic modes have a reduced or an, an effective mass, which is m over two, so half the total mass of this uh, uh, bar detector. And we again uh, we can compute the interaction Hamiltonian now again. Again, there are different approaches to look into this. One is you can take the Hamiltonian in the local inertial frame and then compute, basically add up the effect of tidal forces on each of these atoms. And that what happens is that we find a leading contribution that scales like the mass of the bar detector as well as the length of the bar detectors. Imagine that uh, in the corresponding terms, if you look at a single atom, it is very small because each atom is a, has a tiny uh, mass. But now you are basically looking at a collective mode of this whole bar where you can add up the effect of individual atoms to and that couple strongly. So there is an enhancement that comes from the mass of the system as well as length of the system. And then there is also this uh, extra term, which is which looks like the quadrupole oscillation of each of the each of the uh, modes. So now we use this to look into. Uh, indeed, this is quite exciting that you can see an enhancement in terms of the coupling to gravitational waves. So we look at the spontaneous emission rate from the excited state to the ground state. Again, we use the same kind of argument uh, that one you would use in the hydrogen atom case, but for this uh, massive uh, oscillator. And what we find is that uh, we get a seven orders of magnitude improvement as opposed to what Weinberg uh, predicts. However, this is uh, still much smaller. So it's like 10 raised to minus 33 per second is the rate of the rate at which this bar would spontaneously emit uh, a graviton and that you would detect. And we do this, for example, this numbers come from considering an example of a ni niobium cylinder with a given mass density and sound of speed and so on. So now we look at stimu stimulated absorption or emission events. And these events are essentially uh, we consider in the LIGO band. So we consider a gravitational wave, which comes with the uh, frequency. Uh, so there is a frequency, uh, time dependent frequency in the gravitational wave that you, that the bar experiences. So if you, if I want to briefly pause to mention about the gravitational wave signals that you see in LIGO, you, you know that there are these uh, binary black hole mergers and the gravitational wave that are produced from these mergers have sort of an increasing frequency with respect to time. So these are these chirping signals. So if you if you have slow merging events, there will be th these gravitational waves would spend some time around each of these frequencies in this continuously increasing frequency. So they look like uh, still you can interpret it as continuous waves, uh, single frequency waves in a small uh, tiny uh, window of time. And when you look at this stimulator ab absorption, which also equals stimulated emission rate. We find that there is for one uh, strain amplitude in the LIGO band, we find that for a given aluminum bar, which, which of course Weber was working with aluminum bars, we find that there is one hertz uh, uh, chance of observing a graviton absorption or emission event in, in a stimulated process. So this tells that there can be events like every second, if there's a continuous, uh, there is a continuous incident process happening, then there is a chance of detecting one graviton per second through this uh, approach. 
of course these rates are in a way idealized the scenarios it gives us good good estimates for what's happening but this problem is in fact uh, with some appro approximations we can almost solve exactly so you have a time dependent uh, a gravitational wave coming and there is this interaction hamiltonian we have so we can use magnus expansion or lie algebra or some other methods to go to the interaction picture for example and basically predict what happens to the bar if it is initialized in in the ground state and what we find is that uh, approximately to a good approximation the 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 bar gets excited to a coherent state and with a given coherent state amplitude that basically depends on the source properties for example the chip mass and uh, the profile of the wave and so on and this I, we include everything in this chi so that basically summarizes the effect of the sources and the profile of the gravitational wave how is how does it depend on time and so on and we can for instance from this, we can compute what is the probability that if I do a measurement, a number resolving measurement on the matter side, what is the probability that I get a single absorption event? And the probability actually turns out to be 36%, which is quite consistent with the rates that we derive. And we can basically use this as a precursor to, for example, optimize our detector so that single graviton absorption events are the most likely events with, with the detector. And just to expand, expand slightly on the uh, chi, the, the amplitude of the coherent state up to some three factors, this you can basically numerically estimate, but also you can, you can have uh, from liquid data or you can use uh, some approximation methods too, because currently we have a very good understanding of the for example, this binary merger events and so on, we have a good understanding of the frequency of the gravitational wave. How does it vary with the time? There's good model that works till merger, at least for example, and one could use that and some stationary space methods to approximate what should be the chi value or the response to the gravitational wave essentially. And we, find, we have an estimate for this and this works, which basically goes like the strain amplitude and also the chirp mass uh, in the denominator. So, and it, this, this works quite well for this uh, slow transition through resonance. So the gravitational wave is increasing in frequency with respect to time. If it is doing slowly across the resonance of the bar detector, then we can, that those this approximation works rather quite well in such cases. And the examples of this include, for example, uh, neutron star, neutron star merger events. And again, like I was saying, we can use this, these ideas to predict what should be the optimum mass of a detector such that we have maximum absorption from the ground state to the first excited state of the bar uh, resonator. And here we have a table. Uh, essentially, we look at the different uh, events and known or predicted strain amplitudes or there are some strain amplitudes that are bounded based on literature. And we look at what material or how much weight uh, of the bar detector is required to reach this optimum uh, response from the bar detector. And it's it seems that they are of the order of 100 kilograms or a few tons, but they are not completely out of the picture. So they, they are still realizable in in real I mean, near term experiments and there are already bar detectors which which are in so, sort of uh, in this range and then of course we also look one other important thing is different how do we look into different noise requirements so we obviously want to exclude thermal excita excitation so we look at for example what is the temperatures that you would need so that uh, thermal excitations are suppressed in this uh, window and we will see predominant excitations from the gravitational wave and this is this would also be limited by the Q factors of the cavity and so on. So we also have uh, requirements for what what Q factor we would need. And most of the resonators, I mean, 10 raised to 9, close to 10 raised to 9, and some maybe even 10 raised to 10 is achieved or achievable in the near near term. Again, one other thing I want to highlight is the detector response. So in the photoelectric effect, I was saying that to say that one photon did the job, it is the detector response is also important. So it's not the free, the in the 
intensity of the wave that matters, but the frequency that at which the onset of absorption happens. And here we clearly see that the probability of excitation goes like a sync function. So it's a sharp uh, resonant detector. And if a gravitational wave is chirping through, you don't see much of a response below the resonant frequency and not so much above the resonant frequency, but you can see a sharp transition happening at the at the resonant frequency of a bar detector. This is also to say that we have a good detector for a given frequency that one can look into. And uh, we also need to measure continuously. And there are two reasons. One is that if you are trying to model physical measurements of a quantum system, we know that uh, we have to do this. Uh, any finite, any measurement process is a finite time uh, process. So we have to include this finite time effects, but also, uh, we don't even know when a gravitational wave, it's not a deterministic ministic process that you have a gravitational wave coming at this particular time. Therefore, we need to kind of always be ready to continuously look out uh, whether a gravitational wave is incident or not. And we use the standard uh, measurement model to describe uh, this process in the interaction picture. So we have measurement operators and uh, these uh, displacements uh, by the gravitational wave intervene. And the readout signal is basically the average uh, uh, of the observable we are measuring in this case, the number operator of the of the chosen acoustic mode, and then some Gaussian white noise uh, added to this. So here are some simulated experiments. I want to go through uh, one by one. So what the first sig first panel is the readout signal, which is stochastic uh, uh, readout. And then we wait for, for example, in these plots, up to 40 seconds. In the left side of the screen, what you see is that you don't have, we don't, we do not include any noise. So we have, you wait until 40 seconds and then reset and then again wait 40 seconds. And this 40 seconds is chosen so that it is smaller than the coherence time of the detector. And uh, in this pink window is where we include a gravitational wave interaction with the with the bar detector, and then you continuously measure, and you see one the system collapsing to one one of the eigenstates. In this case, we show an event where it collapses to the first excited state, and this happens with about thirty six percentage chance. In the in the second experiment, second window, we also include like I was saying, one other main possible noise is that. The gravitational wave basically displaces the coherent the the Weber bar to a coherent state or the fundamental mode of the Weber bar that we are looking at into a coherent state. So there could be other displacement noises that come into play. So we include a random displacement and uh, see that, for example, in the first half there could be a random. There was no gravitational wave window, but still you can see some excit excitation due to this noise. And this is where it becomes more and more important that we also correlate with LIGO because LIGO can tell us when a true gravitational wave, if, if there was a true gravitational wave passing through when we detected an absorption in the Weber bar detector. And this correlation with LIGO is also in a way essential to, under, to basically increase the fidelity of detection with Weber bar detectors and using energy measurements in this context. Of course, using more than one uh, Weber bars can increase the fidelity further by maybe removing some common noise factors and so on. But uh, correlating with LIGO is important. In fact, correlating with LIGO is Im important for also inferring these single graviton exchanges because like I was trying to explain, absorption mostly happens at resonance and the rotating wave approximate terms are the leading contribution to the excitation probability across resonance. So basically a classical LIGO can tell us the waveform. So if we can infer whether the, if there was a gravitational wave chirping through the resonance frequency at the given amount of time when I measured a single excitation on the matter side, and this would tell whether a single graviton did the job or not. And we can in fact also use this to tell in, in the same sense of photoelectric effect, uh, compute H bar, for example, because we know the frequency of the wave, frequency of the matter. And uh, yeah, so uh, I would say that Germain called this the gravitophononic effect. So we see single excitations in the Weber bar, and we use this to infer 
energy exchanges at the level of a single quantum, which is the graviton in this case. And we use conservation of energy too, because uh, you could also say that uh, maybe one can use a semi-classical limit to capture the essential features that you see here, but then the traditional or conventional uh, semi-classical limit of QED also violates conservation of energy. And this is something one also uses in this uh, qubit feedback kind of engines and so on. So when you have feedback protocols with the light or laser, then usually the argument goes that uh, the photon came, the energy went with the field that you used to uh, do the feedback control. But uh, usually it is uh, in the semi-classical picture, this amplitude varies traditional semi-classical picture does not account for this uh, amplitude variations in the classic, the classically approximated description of the field. So it is good to uh, emphasize this point too. And of course, there is the time delay argument that I was initially mentioning with respect to the original photoelectric effect or to see quantum gems in general in processes in quantum optics. So we also computed, for example, for an event in the LIGO band given sensitivity by LIGO. Well, how much time would it take for the classical wave to build up uh, the same amount of h bar omega zero energy through a continuous process. And given the energy flux in gravitational waves, we can compute this and the current. Given the current and the energy flux, we can compute this. And uh, we, it turns out to be 10 raised to minus 26 seconds. So it's a really short time scale for the, for example, 10 raised to minus 22 sensitivity of LIGO, for example. And this is actually a quite small time window. There is nothing fundamentally uh, limiting us from measuring within this time scale, but then it's more like a practical limitation to infer if uh, if we measured a jump within this window or not. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude my talk. So here are the conclusions. The main thing is that we can infer, using this, we can infer uh, energy exchanges involving a single graviton. So we, for, for that, we need macroscopic quantum resonators. We need to look into stimulated uh, single absorption events. We need to continuously measure the energy of the bar detector. Remember, you can also measure the energy classically. For example, if you measure the quadratures, you can basically reconstruct the average energy of the oscillator. This would, would not tell the quantized energy exchanges. For that, you need to measure the number operator for the mode that we have looking into. And in fact, the weak interaction also helps. So for Weber, this was an issue because Weber bars uh, weakly interacted with the waves and uh, it was not good enough to detect gravity, classical gravitational waves. But what we are kind of saying is that a weak detector for classical gravitational waves can be a good detector for inferring single graviton or energy exchanges at the level of a single graviton and then of course, we need to correlate with LIGO, which is a very good uh, classical detector to know uh, the frequency of phones actually in carefully. And uh, But most importantly, these, the, the proposal here, it can be achieved within quote-unquote uh, realistic parameters. It's, you need uh, quantum measurement and quantum control at the macroscopic level. We need to ground state cool these massive Weber bars. But I was saying the requirements are like in kilograms or maybe tons. And we need to correlate, obviously we need to correlate with LIGO, but maybe there are better sources that would also reduce the mass requirements, for example, or the length requirements, for example. And I would like to conclude by saying that uh, one cannot, have a, it's maybe, uh, it, this is not a proof of quantum theory of gravity. It's more like uh, what we are doing is that we are inferring energy exchange of quanta analogous to the photoelectric effect. So in the sense of the early 1900s of uh, uh, the quantum theory of light, this is a good inference or this tells us a, this is a major clue if, for example, one could do this in a, one could very hopefully soon do an experiment to detect if you see J quantum gems on the matter side when the Weber bar is interacting with the classical gravitational wave. This would be quite analogous to analogous clue for the existence of uh, uh, gravitons as uh, energy units in the in the in a gravitational way and i would once again thank uh, all my co-authors uh, here also for attending the talk and uh, with that i'm happy to take any questions you have thank you
Yeah, I don't hear anything. I think you're muted too, Vivek. Okay, now I think yes. maybe you should repeat your statement. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you, Sina, for it was a really nice talk, some interesting results, and uh, uh, now just to have some questions for you. That's a very, yeah. very nice talk, Sina. I have several I think, questions. Yeah, One please. is regarding your time scales, because if I think of yeah. a three hundred kilogram chunk of aluminum or something like this, mm -hmm. and yeah. you're talking about the collective modes, acoustic modes of this thing. Yeah. I'd expect a transient time of something like twice the length of this chunk times the speed of sound in order to set up one of the yeah. steady state modes. Yeah. That seems like it would be a much longer time scale of transients than this 10 to the what, minus 26 seconds that you were talking about. Is that a problem? Uh, so yeah. in fact, this so the it is not a problem because so we are computing for something like that, actually. This number comes from uh, a mass, so something like um, in the meters uh, range, and then the mass and speed of sound corresponds to something kind of physical. So the reason is that the energy density or the number of energy density in a classical gravitational wave basically adds. It, it's quite sufficiently huge so that you, a classical wave can add up this much energy in the short enough time scale that we quoted. Yeah, is that was that your question? Uh, is, so sort you want to come of. across? Yeah, it, it would take more more time than ten to minus twenty six seconds to build up H bar omega in the right. bar. Exactly, and also has to do with the fact that you're adding up H bar omega to. I think so. It's also a factor of H bar. Okay, a, 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 a similar question is, I didn't quite understand what this continuous measurement is coupled to. Like what, what sort of device, is it local on different points of this bar? It seems like it would give you a very yeah. local kind of position measurement somewhere and connecting that to a collective vibration mode seems tricky. Um, what did you have in mind for that? Yeah, so what you are pointing out is in, indeed one of the major challenges for this uh, System. So we need to, for example, couple the number operator of the bar to a convenient readout technique like homodyne or something. Then that you read out so you can infer the number of excitations or in, uh, transitions in the number basis. And for massive, if you go mass, more massive and massive systems, there are some works on how to, for example, read out uh, acoustic uh, modes in the fog basis uh, uh, with the superconducting qubits and so on. But we are also increasing the length and mass, so it would need some, uh, yeah, some some more thought into uh, how precisely one would implement that. Of course, one can imagine maybe something with light and, uh, uh, you know, uh, transmission through the bar or uh, some way of inferring this coupling, uh, creating this coupling. But even in uh, even in quantum optics, it's sometimes tricky to generate precisely the coupling that you want to measure. So, yeah. Uh -huh. So, okay. And then the, the third question I have is, you mentioned something like millikelvin temperatures in order to keep this bar at near absolute zero. Yeah. That requires yeah. a very large fridge uh, in order to do this. Uh yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah, the other possibility is that you do this uh, some sort of locally multiple refrigerators. Like, uh, for example, with Andrew, we had this paper of using superconducting fridges. But again, you need, like you said, yeah, it even then you would need to have a bulk cooling mechanism that one can reach. So, like, I mean, paramagnet, like this adiabatic magnetization kind of ideas, but you have to do this in the large scale. That is that is a, a challenge. Right, because I think the, the latest dilution refrigerators get down to the tens of millikelvin Exactly. I think IBM yeah. has a giant recent fridge that gets down to the tens of millikelvin, but you're talking about one millikelvin, right? Yeah, so you can, so this, in these papers with Andrew, I think we have looked at, for example, mound superconduct, bulk superconducting samples on these dilution refrigerators so that you can go from 10 to one millikelvin with adiabatic magnetization or something. Uh -huh. So it is still difficult, like you still need a bulk, a big uh, dilution refrigerator 
where you m mount this. So, I mean, the cooling is a challenge. Yeah. But then you could also um, alleviate the um, the requirements on cooling if you because what we're doing is strictly like making sure that the th all thermal excitations are lower than the signal. But if you had if you just measured the signal above some noise background, that would alleviate the requirements and do some yeah. statistical analysis that like some of the clicks must have been from gravitons or something like something like this. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Jermaine. Yeah, that's a very good point. So we could also, for example, play around a little bit on the on the detector side and then cho also choose frequencies such that we can maybe gain there too so slightly higher but then we'll be looking at a higher frequency window than for example the ligo band but there is also scope to improve in this uh, this way but you, you you also saw in the table that there there could be some rare events where you don't need a huge mass there was like also something with 10 grams which sounds like a small mass compared to Right, the yeah, last one. But exactly. is it like related, like is the rarity related to this, uh, uh, the mass? I don't think so, right? Yeah, uh, so that, you, what determines the mass in exactly, uh, if you can? So the mass is essentially determined by the the properties of the source and like chirp mass and then the detector, the frequency window that we are trying to detect the gravitational waves. So for example, this one that you are referring to, it is, in the megahertz, so this very high frequency, uh, gravitation, rather high frequency gravitational waves uh, from primordial black holes. And uh, the sensitivity that uh, we assume is also rather high, even for LIGO. So that's still a problem, for example, if you want to. So these are more like potential uh, in the future might be possible to even look into these kind of sources and predict uh, absorption. Yes. I have another question ask. if no one else does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I have a question. Uh, okay, you go ahead. Just... Oh, okay. Yeah, Srinath, thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering, so I have two questions. First is, I think along the lines of the second question Justin asked is basically, what I understand is that uh, you are uh, modeling the oscillator quantum mechanically, right? Yeah. Uh, but you are neglecting any sort of decoherence or effect from the environment. Is that so we, the correct so understanding? These temperature uh, requirements and quality factors are basically estimated from this kind of uh, looking into how much thermal excitation one would. Uh, so basically we want to reduce, so if there is a thermal bath, we want to reduce the rate at which uh, you exchange energy with the bath. So the rate, the, that rate also determines the quality factor for the cavity. And of course, we are we want to measure within a time window so that it is within this coherence time determined by these factors. Yes, so we account for that these thermal effects not through a continuous slim blood kind of approach, but the effective one can in fact deduce the coherence time and this kind of effective time scales and requirement for quality factors just from the the decay rate to the bath. And yeah, that's what we do. And that all, that's how we also compute the temperature that you need, like one millikelvin or something. That comes from this consideration, actually. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, my second question is that, uh, so you're modeling the interaction as like B plus B dagger sort of mm -hmm. interaction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering, have you thought about, I think the effect will be like very negligible, but have you thought about um, higher order terms that can produce like some sort of squeezing. Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, in fact, one one of the things that we compute but uh, not use in this paper yet in this direction in this paper, but thinking of as well is this the fact that the higher order correction to the higher order correction is quadratic. So it to so this is so we we have a quadrupole expansion, but then because you are looking at these collective modes, you it turns out there is a linear contribution that scales linearly with the length. So, so that is also like quadrupole. And then there is a quadrupole of each of these acoustic modes. And that would induce skewing in addition to this coherent state evolution, but it is suppressed by the, because of this length refactor, you get a better, uh, the, this leading contribution is the linear one in this problem. See, the length is the length of the bar. The bar, yeah. Thanks. 
Understood. Oh, my, my other question was about this chirp, because you're relying on the uh, stimulated emission from some event that has a high yeah. amplitude, right? But those events are chirping typically because they're like in spiraling events. Exactly. Um, that's going to decrease the um, the cross sectional time scale, right? Because it, it's only exactly. in the resonant frequency really? for a very short time. Uh, yeah. Are you taking that into account in your estimations here? Yeah, that's what we are. So that's precisely what we are uh, doing actually. In, in so this uh, this and we we see this uh, deviation from. I mean, it's it's actually a good uh, estimate. For all the sources that you see. So what Justin was mentioning is that when a, the gravitational wave chirping through this window means that the frequency is changing with respect to time. And you can basically think of it as for a very small window of time there is a given frequency, but then it would change. And uh, for rapid merger events, so the, the frequency, how, how they change with respect to time depends on the source. And, and there are certain sources where this variation in the chirping frequency with respect to time is slow, so these are slow varying chirps, I think we call it like that. In these cases, we can make this uh, approximation that there is this resonance window and then this excitation happens at resonance is a good uh, good characterization. And we, we basically solve this exactly this problem, but then we see that these approximations that we make that uh, we can still think of that main contribution only coming from this rotating wave approximation and the reson on resonance kind of regime is actually true for most of the source, almost all of the sources that we have looked at, or the gravitational wave uh, amplitudes that uh, LIGO provides. So, so, so one can basically, for example, the, the, what Justin is referring to, so you can compute this response in the stationary phase approximation. So then there is this leading contribution that comes from on resonance kind of interaction, and then there are subleading contributions with both like the higher order corrections in a stationary phase uh, approximation kind of thing. And uh, what we find is that in fact, the leading contribution is, is a leading, is basically captures the effective uh, absorption probabilities and the maximum of transition rate and so on. Even if you include the other, they are sort of subleading contributions for the, for the variations that, for the time scales of the gravitational waves in the LIGO band. So, so this estimate for chi that uh, I think it's here. This basically assumes sort of uh, this kind of analysis. We look at the different time scales, and uh, so uh, that's how we get into this uh, chi factor, which 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 is essentially this response to a chirping gravitational wave. But you can basically get a single number out of it, which works really well for slow transition through resonance, but also rather well for other LIGO events that we were looking at. Questions? Any questions on Zoom? If no further questions, let's thank Srinath again. Mm -hmm.